one of the real gifts of that warhorse process was um you knew when you looked those guys in the face on the first in the auditions or on the first day of puppet training the ones who'd never done any puppetry before but in three months time someone was going to come up to them and say that's the most incredible puppetry that they've ever seen and that this guy is standing here today <laughs> going, i don't know what this is <laughs> Welcome back to Puppeteers. I'm your host, Adam Krutinger, and we have Cameron Garrity back again as our co-host. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. And today is another very special interview. We have Mervyn Miller. Woo! Welcome to the show, Mervyn. Hello. So Mervyn is uh, a man about town in the puppetry world. You know him from works um, such as Circus 1903, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, a little show called War Horse, and uh, he has a new book out called puppetry how to do it uh really it's available cool. in digital bookstores everywhere so mervyn miller welcome to puppet tears pleasure to be here absolutely so uh what, what have you been up to um i'm just in the middle of uh, the technical rehearsals for a, a new show at the royal shakespeare company so oh terrific class, uh theater <laughs> sure now cool. is it a, a work of the bard or is it a new piece yeah, it's as you like it, and um, it's, um, it's it was a slightly strange one. The, the designer and the um, director came to me and said, "Oh, you know, we've got this idea," and they and they pretty much they had a plan for how they wanted it all to look. And um, but it it really is a huge puppet that comes on right at the end of the play, in a way that under normal circumstances you would say this is a terrible, terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> so of course I said, "Yeah, let's do it." Absolutely. Awesome. Now, um, it seems like a bit of a theme of you working with big puppets. Is that something that you've sort of been pigeonholed into in the last couple of years? Or is that a place that you're really comfortable in? How, um, how did that kind of happen? I think it's come from the back of being involved in Warhorse, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I've always I've always worked in theater um, rather than on on pure puppetry shows. and. Um, I think because of War Horse, people started to ask for animals, and um, the um, uh, the elephants, you know, were pretty big. And um, yes, I, maybe the people just want big puppets now. So, um, and uh, I, I, I've happened to have been there and said yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I like small puppets too. Yeah. Available. <laughs> Yeah, I think we all like work. That's, uh, that's right. right. <laughs> have, having consistent work. Uh, now I have a question. I look, I'm looking at your website and stuff. Significant object. What exactly is that? Is that a is that an actual production company or what? What exactly is does that? Uh, it's me and whoever I'm working with at the time, really. Um, and um, I just we'd um, I'd had companies in the past where I'd been working with other people, but they hadn't been puppetry thing uh, companies, and so I. Um, uh, we had a, a short project here shortly after Warhorse, which was uh, called Handspring UK, which was a, a group of the puppeteers who'd, who'd come together from Handspring's involvement. Um, and that was a kind of project for a couple of years, which kind of got a, a bit of momentum around us. And um, and then we went our separate ways and formed a couple of different companies. And I just have never been quite... Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'm an egomaniac, but... Uh, I didn't quite bring myself to call, to want to call myself Mervyn Miller Puppets. Um, so I thought, you know, let's have a name and it's nice to have a company name. Um, and I had this dim memory of a, a scenography class in college where uh, someone started talking about, you know, one of the approaches to classical theatre design being a significant object on stage, you know, and you imagine those kind of 1980s set designs with a enormous pitchfork in the middle of the stage or a huge globe, you know, kind of, yeah. um, uh, massively disproportionate. Um, and uh, I'd always liked the phrase, but um, uh, I thought actually what we're doing is is more that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what we what we do is more significant and and more like an object. So. <laughs> And um, can be significant if it's just the size of a small stick or something. So well, right. <laughs> it's in all sorts of ways. I or a it. bag of apples. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, so you're in, obviously involved in puppetry. You said you're, you've been involved in theater. Where, where did that kind of all start for you? How long has that been going on? Um, I came to puppetry through theater uh, in that I... Um, and it largely happened because of uh, ignorance. And um, 
Uh, my school, I went to a, a, a kind of normal, um, um, uh, non-paying school in, uh, in London, and it wasn't the kind of school that taught drama, so we didn't we didn't have that option. We did, I didn't study any theatre until I was at university uh, where I was studying English. But I, I wanted to make shows, and um, no one had ever told me not to use puppets. Whereas I think if you do like a, um, um, a high school level uh, theatre course, they'll they'll tell you what's acceptable and proper in a you know professional uh, grown up theatre production, <laughs> and um, they won't mention puppets. Or maybe they will now, but they they wouldn't have then. So when I suggested using puppets in, in shows at university, I got a lot of sideways looks, and um, people said that's very interesting, which is English for wrong. <laughs> and then we would um you know i would stop using puppets for a bit <laughs> but they always came back so, because it just seemed like a very natural uh choice to have something on stage that's not played by an actor you know sometimes and um and once you're well as you know once you start down the rabbit hole it gets more and more interesting the more you investigate it and the more you look at all the different styles of puppetry so I started just doing puppets in my own work. Um, and then there comes a point when someone asks you to do puppets for their show. Uh, someone says, oh, I hear you do puppets. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm doing The Sound of Music and uh, I need a little goat herd. Could you make me a little goat herd? <laughs> you think, <laughs> I'm, yes, OK, that's very nice to be asked. <laughs> um, but um, the big difference was that when you make something for someone else, you have to give them what you said you'd give them, which <laughs> <laughs> radically different from when I'm making my own stuff, uh, where you know the show changes if the puppet changes, and um, you're in the middle of that. So it's been, um, but because of that, I, you know, my training really was as a theatre director, and that's still really where I locate myself. You know, I'm I'm a theatre director who specialises in puppets, and what that means for work is that usually I'm working as a puppetry director on someone else's show. Um, but I'm really um, motivated by the the fact that I've spent so long trying to work in a big rehearsal room with people who many of whom won't be puppeteers by background on trying to get something something to happen that's a little bit more than um, you know choreographing them hurriedly <laughs> um, which you know is usually what you're given enough time to do. Right. Well, and that's something that you talked about in in your book is just getting someone to a place where they feel comfortable with the object, the sort of puppet tool, but then the comfortable to make mistakes and finding things to grow from in those mistakes that they're making. I think so. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of my um, a lot of my career and a lot of my um, uh, viewpoints are, are indebted in a, in a big way to, to Handspring. And we'll talk about that kind of meeting as we go on but um and um, that you know they've been a big influence and the other thing that happened when we did warhorse again you know the first time we made warhorse we all scrambled to try and get a show on just like we normally do when you're making a show um and um you're just just trying your best um but when we started to when when we were trying to find people to bring them in to be in a show for a year um it was like a big um, eye opener for me because you know I'd talked about um, trusting actors and talked about you know giving you know agency to the performers you know <laughs> it all in all those ways that you do theoretically but it was only when you sat down and thought I I'm not here to teach these guys how to do what we did last year I I need these guys to stay interested in giving this performance otherwise it will get stale and it'll get boring and it'll be useless and if the puppetry is bad in that show then you know people will stop coming to see it um so suddenly the the whole way of thinking about what you're trying to give that performer in rehearsal was was i'm not trying to give you the best performance i'm actually just trying to give you a bunch of tools and games and enough enough kind of silly games for you to play within that group that you're in that you won't get bored <laughs> um, <laughs> And people who are puppeteers already know that, I think. They know that part of the joy of doing a puppet show is that you never get it right and you keep, you, there's always something to explore. But, um, you know, people from other performing backgrounds um, 
I don't think you get that attitude if you go into the uh, the next you know touring cast of Wicked or um, mm. you know a, a, a big machine musical. I think yeah. you get told exactly where to stand. You know, yeah, it's kind of the opposite of like uh, choreography, where you got to do it the same every time. You know, uh, uh-huh. it's interesting. Yeah. So you know, you want you, you, you they've got to hit their marks and they've got to be on cue, but they're uh, it, it's got to feel. Um, it's got to feel improvised. It's got to feel alive, especially, you know, because in the in the case of that show, they're being an animal. And yeah. the only thing that we really recognize about animals is they're completely reactive. Yeah, <laughs> to it. yeah exactly. Well, and it reminds me, I think I heard in, in an interview or some video that Handspring put out, I, I want to say it was Adrian who mentioned the idea that... Um, not getting the the horse to kind of step to the beat of the music <laughs> because it's not a Disney character. Um, and just kind of training that out to make sure that the character, while still present in the show, is removed from some of the action because it exists on that that level of thinking. Um, it's, it's kind of the same thing you're trying to have your puppeteers do in a way. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, you know, there's something that else that we learned from, from, from pretending to be horses, which seems, seems to have wider application for puppets. Uh, of all kinds, which was that, um, of course, one of the things that the puppeteers want to do when they've got into the big horse and have got the basics right, is they go, oh, could we do dressage? You know, we do uh, horse tricks. <laughs> and um, and of course, when you watch a horse move like a um, move like a machine, it's an incredible feat of training. And it seems completely bizarre and extraordinary because horses shouldn't be able to do that. But like a puppet horse moving like a machine just looks like a bad puppet horse, <laughs> like yeah. it, um, um, and and I think it, you know, it applies to ballet as well. You know, when you see contemporary dance or ballet, and you watch people doing things, and you think human body can't do that. How are you doing that? It's amazing, and and, and emotion comes with that. But when the puppet moves like a um, like a machine, or like a you know like an object, it it can really destroy. You can't get any emotion out of it, and you just see the mechanics, and it's um. Um, dancing puppets is dangerous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, <laughs> just like they can, you can kill your puppets. <laughs> right? Yeah, I never thought of that before. Um, cool. Well, before we keep talking on about the warhorse time of your life, I, I, we started talking about for puppetry first coming in into you. Uh, mm. What uh, what what did your first puppet kind of look like, either from what you were directing or what you were first building for people, besides uh, lonely goat herds? Yeah, I mean, right at the beginning in that in that kind of university phase where I didn't know anyone who could make puppets, and I didn't know anyone uh, who was interested in it really. I, um, I was directing Volpone, which is a uh, Ben Johnson, who's a contemporary of Shakespeare. He's a, he's a comedy writer, and um, uh, like a lot of plays of that period, uh, the last scene has everybody that was in the play previously in it, who you've all been doubling, uh, and then a couple of other characters come in at the end, like you were judges. And um, I suppose a little bit like what I'm doing for the RSC this week. Um, I thought, well, clearly these two judges who are going to sort all the plot out should be puppets because there's a um, in the in the for, to do that show you need a window frame in the set and it's like a really obvious glove puppet booth. And um, and in fact, the writer Ben Johnson writes um, about glove puppets in other plays of his. And so I thought, okay, yeah, and they were terrible, awful, horrible things that I'd made. Um, Papier mache and bits of old cardboard and weird bits of wire, um, and um, yeah, I think because I was too, we don't, we didn't really have a puppetry network around at the time. I think that I was that I understood how to get involved with. So, like a lot of people, I was kind of pretty self-taught early on, and so I I started making things really badly and exploring foam and and stuff and. Um, uh, and I, I remain a, a, a not brilliant puppet maker. You know, I'm, I, I love um, I love the mechanics of puppets. I love uh, problem solving the the, the um, mechanical elements particularly, and uh, I'm really fascinated by how where you can put the puppet in relation to the puppeteer to give them the best control, um, to give them the easiest relationship with it. Um, so I'm a bit suspicious of kind of over mechanizing puppets. Um, because, you know, there's no mechanism better than this, you know, this wrist that people have got that's, you know, infinitely subtle. Um, and, um, 
but um, yeah, I uh, as time's gone on, I've been lucky enough to meet loads of people who are really good at making things. And at a certain point, you say, <laughs> I don't want to look at my sewing anymore. I, I, <laughs> I, I know sewing. exactly what that feels like. <laughs> and they'll sew all day, and they'll like it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and we the opposite of what would happen with me, and, um, <laughs> and it won't look terrible, and um, it'll look, in fact look really beautiful. So you think, okay, well, actually, my job in creating these things is to is to work with the director and the designer to tease out what they want, work out what that means as a design, and then start to work in collaboration with makers who um, who understand puppets ideally, and. Um, and then work alongside them to make. So sometimes I'll make things, but um, uh, bits and pieces that, that I think I understand and can't explain properly. Um, but because I'm not trained as a designer, I do terrible technical drawings mm. and <laughs> terrible drawings of all kinds. Um, and then, um, you know, it, uh, uh, and then I take it into the rehearsal room and then, I, and you know, and then that, that bridge happens. Okay. That wasn't an answer to your question really. It, went off no that, that that's okay i think that's something that any any show or project that has a puppet needs is sort of an, an ambassador to puppetry um i mean we i mean i'm sure anyone who's listening to this and certainly we have all sorts of experiences of people who um want puppets or think they want puppets um yeah. and then want to press on whether or not it works correctly for the project or not or if it's elevating the story they want to tell or not um so to have someone like you to to be there and and help guide through that creative process i think is invaluable do you do you ever work with uh with directors that are like obsessed with wanting to hide the puppeteers by any chance um that's not been such an issue recently i think when i started and you know i was sort of going around doing this job a little bit before War Horse as well. There was a little bit more, you know, War Horse did a good job of, of helping people understand that the puppeteers being visible wouldn't be uh, such a challenge. Um, and of course, you know, people like you and I have been watching that in puppet festivals for decades, you know, I mean, yeah. it wasn't, it's not something that was new then, but uh, it was new to the, some of those mainstream theatre maker audiences. Um, no, actually what happens now sometimes is that, um, is that the, the director says, now I know this is a bit radical, but I'm thinking about putting them in black. <laughs> With it, you go, <laughs> that might be quite interesting. I haven't done that for a long time. <laughs> so um, sometimes it's the right thing to do. I mean, I think because, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the fashion in theatre now, sensibly, and the part of the reason people like puppets again, uh, or are interested in puppets, is that it's so manifestly artificial, right? And it's so clearly not an illusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, your heart sinks a little bit when someone <laughs> says, yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe they should, I kind of wish, are they going to be in the way like that? You know? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that goes hand in hand with the with the design as well. Because I'm looking at your website and all the different projects that you've worked on. So not only can you see the puppeteers for most of them, but also a lot of times the puppets themselves are like pared down to like the bare essential right. like, like looking at the lion from the the witch in the wardrobe um and like it doesn't even have like a torso it looks like or right, even the right. neck it's just like three pieces so and i imagine sometimes working with a director or a artistic director in a theater show how do you sometimes have to convince them of that that that's the best choice yeah definitely i mean the reason i ended up working like that was because when we've been developing shows and again you know that um Process with Handspring and the National and War Horse was part of that. We would quite often be using objects and things and kind of mocking something quickly with a few bits and pieces. And you're always thrilled by how um, how your mind connects the the parts. You know, it's always sort of exciting to to see how little you need to to kind of plant that image. And um, you know, again, try to develop that. Um, is interesting and of course because adrian um is such a, a kind of consummate um uh, sculptor um when we came out of that process with warhorse there was a there was a moment where we where we were kind of going oh well maybe the horses shouldn't be so you know uh, shouldn't be so complete but um 
we kind of knew that Adrian would come back with a really beautiful horse puppet <laughs> because that's what he does. Um, so, um, and when we did the lion, um, the designer and director showed me a model box, a uh, white card model box, which, um, and they said, okay, so this is our idea. And it was a, it was a four meter high at the shoulder, um, uh, origami lion. And, and they said, you know, using a lot of paper, we've got a kind of concept in the thing, it's about to do with paper. And um, I said, that's a bit big. <laughs> and uh, we had to sort of demonstrate that um, the, the thing, that the thing looked great in the, in the model, I've got to say, I mean, it looked beautiful. But um, once the lion was on stage, there wasn't any room for anybody else. You know, to be on stage around it. So you're like, I don't know what, what scenes we can do with this other than, shit, look at this beautiful lion. <laughs> um, and um, and so we said we said a couple of things. We said, okay, four meters seems a bit big. And they would go, no, no, we think you should try it. Um, and um, this question of movement is, the mo this question of movement and the question of anatomy are, are, are kind of really present. And um, you say, okay, well, what's exciting about a lion? It's like it's kind of, Oh, kind of curvy and kind of stretchy and muscular and how the hell am I going to build that <laughs> at that scale um controllable by people who are definitely not going to be professional puppeteers because they're going to have to in this show they're going to have to sing they're going to have to be in three other acting roles you know and they're going to be rotating around so um uh we built it we built a huge cardboard lion <laughs> in a rehearsal room in a few days and just said okay this is what it would be like it would be this big and here's a leg with um all the parts with all the body parts in the right places in the right proportions and it moves like this and then we said okay now i'm going to take away the middle part of that leg uh, and show you what we can do if there's no kind of limb there there's no puppet there and um i mean straight away the movement obviously is much much better because it's not you know a, an animal skeleton is has got all this kind of elasticity and flexion in it that um would be very challenging to create and um and so we said well let's go for it you know and and um especially this thing about a cat's back like man who, you know who's ever seen a really good cat puppet <laughs> you know, lots of really nice ones and they and all of them do one thing really well different different cat things but um to try and make one that does everything really well actually <laughs> it's it's as much of it is in the imagination of the audience as possible and that sudden and that then opened up another big door to me you know in, in terms of theory of kind of saying well actually the best puppets <laughs> are kind of not there at all but <laughs> um and what in in that case what am i building am i i'm not trying to build the perfect cat I'm trying to build something that allows you to imagine a lion in the right place where I want it to be and, and to show you enough of that behavior. And that's been really useful in terms of um, thinking about what the audience do and kind of saying, I'm not giving you a show, I'm suggesting some stuff to you and you're imagining the rest of it. And the more we th look at puppets that, you know, even, even quite, um, figurative expressive puppets with moving eyes and mouths and and all of that there's still loads that isn't moving that you feel is moving you feel is there that isn't there um and that seems like that's um that's the magic for me you know when people and, and the directors do quite often say oh we need a bit of magic and you think i can't do magic uh, <laughs> you don't really need magic actually what you need is the audience to be engaged in your show Right, some, <laughs> some visual <laughs> metaphor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and when you look at how kind of, I mean, I, I know some nice magicians, but you know, how technical and emotionless magic, <laughs> kind of country magic is, you know, compared to what puppetry fundamentally is, which is something totally emotional and totally about connecting with the audience and not manipulating the audience actually. Um, they couldn't be more different, you know. Yeah, totally. Going back then to you're you're doing the directing and um, starting to to work on puppetry stuff, and then uh, Tall Horse, you were involved in that, right? Which was sort of the proto uh, project to to War Horse. Yeah, kind of. So I'd been I'd been running a pub theatre. You know, if you're uh, trying to make cheap theatre in in London, you, there are these uh, small rooms above pubs that hold about 50, 60 people. I've been running one of the 
and directing new plays. And um, and then in other pub theatres, I'd been doing weird installation shows that were devised with designers that, that had puppets in. Mm. And so, um, and these would be for very small audiences and kind of a, a festival crowd, I guess we would think of it. And, um, and starting to get a couple of these little gigs where you'd be making puppets for a, 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 an established theatre company. Um, but those would tended to be, uh, but I re didn't really know what I was doing very well. I wasn't making puppets that were excellent. I was, I was unusual in that I felt comfortable in the theatre rehearsal room. And I was kind of going, there's no one making the kind of thing that I'm interested in because a lot of the puppeteers that I could see were really interested in making pure puppet shows. And there was a brilliant company called um, Faulty Optic. And both of the people who used to run that company are, are, are still working, but separately, Gavin Glover and Liz Walker. And uh, they made these awesome uh, shows that were kind of about an hour long uh, without text. Uh, kind of weird, surreal, dark little worlds. Um, and as I was watching them and I was watching some people who were doing really interesting work, but children. Um, and uh, I was thinking, this isn't really what I want. And then um, uh, Handspring came to do um, Ubu and the Truth Commission. And it was, it, was, um, it was already about five years old by then. And they, so they were right at the end of the first tour of it. And they gave a two week workshop and I signed up for this workshop, not really knowing who they were and not having seen the show. Um, and we got on really well and they were doing puppets breathing. And we did a workshop where, as far as I recall, most of what we were doing was uh, imagining, um, for some reason I can't remember, Portuguese sailors writing letters to their lovers at home, their wives at home. And you would, and you would try and animate a puppet who was trying to express <laughs> loads of emotion, but not say it, just think it and write something down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of a brilliant exercise. Um, and, uh, and I was like, oh yeah, this is it. But also seeing the show that I, the, seeing the show that I saw of the, of the Ubu show, which was um, one of the brilliant shows that they made with William Kentridge. Um, I came away going, this is a brilliant theater show that happens to be performed partly by puppets. And that's what I'm interested in. You know, it's um, the sound design is excellent. The script is really good. The light design is great. The scenic design is great. The acting's good. And the puppets are beautiful. Um, so I was really excited by them. And um, by that, by then I'd found an organization called the Puppet Center, which um, existed to kind of uh, widen the appreciation of puppetry. And um, they did bursaries and they gave me a little bit of money to go to South Africa, which I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. And Handspring said, yeah, sure, if you can pay to get here, we can't pay you, but, you know, that's cool. <laughs> um, and I said, what are you doing next year? And they said, oh, we're doing this show. And I shouldn't um, speak out of turn, but I think that the, the show had, had quite a long history already. It had been, I think, originally conceived by the Kennedy Centre as, a, um, as an, a Lion King that would actually be made by Africans. <laughs> 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 um, how, about, <laughs> how about making a show about Africa with, 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 people, with people who've been there? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it was this brilliantly ambitious international collaboration, and they'd kind of gathered a lot of these people. And so they'd found Handspring, they'd found this mm, crazy, brilliant, beautiful choreographer called Coffee Coco from um, West Africa, and they'd found this um, Malian troupe. Uh, and uh, the Sogolon troupe, um, and uh, uh, Yo-Yo Koulibaly is the, is the kind of leader of that company. And I think they might even have found the composer as well. Anyway, so they they put this thing together and then they'd not been able to fund it. And everyone had got really excited about it. And, you know, they had some meeting and they, they could either fund a Tennessee Williams season or a this weird African thing. <laughs> and, you know, they went for, the, <laughs> went for the one that would sell tickets. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, and Handspring went home and said, well, I would really have liked to do that. <laughs> um, and so um, Basil is a very persistent and determined man. And he found a gold mining company, as you do, and um, convinced them that it would be good <laughs> PR for them to, to pay for a theatre show. Um, and so that's what they were doing. And um, yeah, it was a bonkers and 
uh, confusing and exhausting and exhilarating and impossible thing. Um, and um, it had a lot had some elements that really were um, very useful in terms of how the thinking about Warhorse um, went forward. Uh, like the idea that you have this animal at the center of the story that behaves like an animal fundamentally. Um, and um, and then people around it. But in that show, it was much more puppety. It was much more um, kind of extraordinary and spectacular because you, you had a puppet animal, uh, human actors, um, and then handspring puppet actors, and then Marlian puppet actors, and um, all of them trying to act on the same stage. And we found out pretty early on that uh, the style of performance of the Marlian company was really different from handspring style. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and, and the, those puppets, when they arrived, you thought, wow, they're really crude, kind of clumsy. They can't, you can't control them properly. You know, they kind of, everything's loose and wobbly and, um, and they've got these huge heads and they're really heavy, really heavy. Um, and uh, I mean, Adrian's puppets are heavy too, but, you know, it's different. <laughs> and, um, and I think Basil said one day, you know, uh, Handsprings Theatre starts with a dark room and, you know, there's a puppet in the middle of a dark room and then you start putting lights on it. And then, you know, fundamentally, it's a European chamber theatre tradition of making shows. And um, the Marley and Company's conception starts with a, a, a village square in the daytime with a load of other stuff going on. And, you know, the Handspring show will perform for, you know, 45 beautiful minutes or <laughs> and the Marley and show might take four or five hours. And... <laughs> you know, have a lot of drumming in it. And so it was, it's not just that um, they perform in different styles to suit their audience. Their whole conception of what the hell you're doing with the puppet was radically different. <laughs> <laughs> and you get a kind of, you know, Broadway writer on <laughs> and throw that into the mix. And it was crazy, <laughs> but brilliant. You know? Yeah. Suddenly everyone has like three different mission statements that they're working towards. <laughs> in yeah. Ways. Well, and, and also because they're all generous, you know, and as you, you'll know, this puppet is a kind of generous to a fault um, and they're lovely people. Um, and sometimes that means that um, they're not pushing each other around enough. <laughs> so there's this kind of, um, you're kind of, okay, well, who's, the poor director was trying to, actually, you know, you're not just pulling together collaborators who understand how each other work. You're having to forge a totally new uh, style to, to, to fit these things together or teach someone to work a way they never worked before. So it was, a, it was a really fascinating project to be on the edge of, and really I was only observing. But while that was happening, um, Tom Morris, who is uh, a, a director and producer who, I'd, who I knew quite well from um, Fringe Theatre in, in, uh, in South London, um, he'd started working at the National, and his job had been, it was to kind of find um, weird theatre companies and bring them into the ship, bring them into the building um, so that the National could seem a little bit less old fashioned. And um, and he did bring in a number of really important and interesting collaborations with the, there's an Icelandic circus troupe who did loads of shows around that time. There was Knee High and Handspring was another one where he said, I'd really like to get Handspring in for something. And so they came to look at Tall Horse with a view to maybe putting it on. And I think they looked at it and went, it's not quite, <laughs> not quite hanging together in the way that we would like. <laughs> um, but, um, but there's clearly extraordinary artistry here. And um, let's try and find something for them. Um, and because I was lucky enough to be someone who knew Handspring and worked with them, someone who Tom had worked with him, um, when workshops came up, uh, development workshops, we, they would say, um, OK, well, Merv, come and... Um, you know, find me some puppeteers for that workshop and help them prep stuff. And, and so that that kind of, um, I had that kind of role throughout the development where joining things together, but without any kind of specific respons area of responsibility. And uh, yeah, and kind of being in the right place at the right time <laughs> in yeah. a lot of ways, it seemed, sounded yeah, like. Yeah, completely. And actually, uh, um, uh, I think, um, you know, when I was doing that bursary, I wasn't the only person who was interested in going to work with Handspring. So 
you know, if I hadn't got that bursary, someone else would have gone and, <laughs> you know, I don't know, I'd be, I'd be doing something else, I guess. <laughs> Uh, so uh, when you were in the rehearsal room uh, it, 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 working on Warhorse and helping to, to create it, um, is that when Handspring started putting together the uh, their principles of puppetry that then uh, sort of founded the teaching of Warhorse for other companies? Or did that come once it was sort of up on its feet? No, it was a conscious thing. I think I remember in Tall Horse they had... Um, they were reaching out beyond their habitual group. And so in the past, they'd made relatively small shows, and so a relatively small group of people could, could perform them. Um, and for Tall Horse, they had to start teaching some uh, some people who could be actors um, how to do things. They'd been um, doing a, a, an opera with Kentridge, which still tours, the Retourno du Lycée. Um, and they'd done a... And um, in between the two... No, before... Before Tall Horse, they'd done a, a project about chimpanzees doing sign language, um, yeah. which um, again they'd they'd had to teach some actors. So I I think they hadn't um, organised the the principles yet, but they had they had started to get into the habit of trying to communicate to someone um, how to do their the kind of puppetry that they wanted, and um, you know they did their strength of character was really important in that moment of developing Warhorse because, um, you know, maybe it's because they come from a fine art background, but they're absolutely confident about the the merit and value of puppetry. And, you know, a lot of us, um, uh, for the sake of social kind of fluency, try and play it down and not, you know, not be too big about ourselves. Um, but Basil's great. He'll come in and he'll say, this is very important work. What we're doing is unprecedented. It's a very high art form and it's very refined and it's not to be taken lightly. And um, and so that that extended to the point where we were saying, OK, this will be a blend of physical actors, puppeteers, non-physical actors <laughs> um, and uh, and all sorts of people, you know, that we need to make the show. And And he said, well, you know, we need to have time to teach them not just how to use these puppets, but what it means to be a puppeteer. And I don't just want to teach them our puppets. I want them to to watch and learn about shadow puppetry and glove puppetry and Indonesian puppetry and, you know, and all the things that they've never heard of so that they can understand where this comes from and what they're doing, because they know that about, you know, um, Pinta or, you know, uh, Eugene O'Neill, you know, they, they understand the... The hinterland of that literature uh, so when they do this kind of performance they need to understand where it comes from otherwise it's meaningless um and um most puppeteers wouldn't have asked to do that <laughs> and most these companies would have just said yeah that's nice but you've got uh you know morning so go <laughs> um, but you know they're stubborn and they knew what they knew what they had um and that again um it was a massive lesson to me about how how you can relate to people about and 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 how you need to talk to people about what you're doing you know because we we have read a lot we have seen a lot we have done a lot uh, to come to where we are and and it is really easy to come in and and kind of go oh well we just you know um doing something simple and fun and it's cool um but sometimes you need to um teach it so yes so that it, that was part of that project where they were saying okay shit how do i um <laughs> how do i give people a proper perspective on, on what i want them to do um and um yes so that that document started to get made for those that process and um and then it would change a bit and people would add things to it and um and then Baz would go away and refine it again yeah I love that. And um, something that I, when I found out about that when I was probably in, in college or so, uh, something I really responded to, and Adam and I have both sort of uh, continued to, to talk about this when we do classes and stuff, is uh, the idea of the devotional state to the puppet, which I'm sure right. as you work on all these big characters is something that you have to really sort of let people know about. Um, and you know the idea of it's going to be uncomfortable um if you're if you're uncomfortable or excuse me if you're comfortable you're doing it 
uh, wrong, <laughs> but allowing yeah. that, uh, we won't call it pain, but allowing the positioning and, and what kind of state your body has to be and allowing that to influence the character. Can you talk about that? Not necessarily just in, in this terms of war horse, but all like kind of the different projects that you've come along. Cause that was, that's yeah. fascinating to me. I guess I have a different way of talking about it. Um, but I, I recognize what, what he means and I, and I, I, I can relate very closely to, to why he wanted to say that. And, and, and it's because Adrian's puppet's really heavy. No, it's because, <laughs> <laughs> it's because he was, he, he wants to say, cause he's been doing these shows with these puppets. Um, and, um, and he's going, actually, do you know what? The experience of doing this show is really hard, but I really care about doing it well. And, and, the, and the challenge for you as a, as, a, as a director, when you know you come out from being a performer, you can lead by example, but if you're stopping being a performer and becoming a director, you have to try and communicate this somehow. You, you might want to communicate that somehow to the people who are doing the, the job. So you say, okay, well, um, and that was Basil's way of expressing it. And he found that uh, that phrase about the devotional state, I found really interesting um, in terms of what it, what it says about him and what it says about what it can feel like um, surrendering your body to this kind <laughs> of experience of, of, uh, uh, of creating something that you believe to be beautiful and worthwhile. Um, now that's not always the attitude of the people you're working with. So, um, and quite a lot of people are pretty irreverent and don't respond particularly to being told that um, this work is of artistic value and therefore it should hurt. Um, so, so, you know, you find different ways of saying it and, 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 it, and it works on, on different levels because you, you get them to care about the character, you get them to care about the performance that they're giving, you give them respect. Um, and say it's you who gives the performance. The puppet is a beautiful puppet, but actually, the puppet doesn't do anything without you. And that's why I usually teach people with objects, especially the non puppet especially the non puppeteers, need to do object stuff for me before they get the puppet, in order to get to this conversation. Because you say, okay, you can do it with this stick or this rough, rough cut puppet. Um, uh, when you get the real puppet, you might find this a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Um, but I want you to try and communicate as clearly as you have been with this rough puppet. And um, and so you might say, yeah, it's going to be a bit heavy. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, you, or you start to find, you know, I work with these paper, um, paper people that Adrian designed. Um, there's a moment in, in, in the paper person where uh, the puppeteers find that they've got to be on their knees or kind of crouching down. They're kind of slightly awkward position. And you can make jokes about that in the teaching process in a way that's not challenging, that is just kind of, yeah, I'm not interested in, in you, I'm interested in the puppet. Um, let's see the puppet do something and I'm sorry if it's uncomfortable. And people understand because they want to do it well. And if they've got an audience of their friends, the other people in the show to do it to, then they, they start to clown around and they start to find the pleasure. That's what you need to teach them. You need to teach them the pleasure is worth the discomfort and then um and then once they've got that equation then then it's just a matter of scale and then it's just a matter of detail because you're just saying okay well sorry this one um this one's really you're going to wear it on your back and you've got to be hunched over or something um how long can you do that for and you've got to respect them enough to have that conversation with them and um uh and that way they can still be proud of their um their performance and i think that's that, that that's it it's just you know if you care about the puppeteer then you've got a chance that they'll care about the puppet <laughs> and if you try, if you push them around and shout at them and tell them what to do they they're going to lose interest they're going to break your puppet <laughs> they're going <laughs> to they're going to let you down when you leave the room you know because they don't they don't they haven't you haven't got them engaged in the show so that's my take on it is it's a it is a little bit more kind of down to earth about how do we make it how do we make someone interested in doing a show um but yeah it's definitely the case that um the puppets can be hard i suppose the other part the other side of the devotional thing is about the weird energy that 
the puppeteer gives to the puppet when it when they're visible and um and it is it is weird in every sense especially in that we don't quite understand how it works but you know that when especially if it's one of those puppets that's framed by a couple of people and they really care and they're really just trying to tune in with each other and they're doing something really precise um that focus that they're giving they're not putting it on it's not you know they're not going into a devotional state they're just doing their job really well <laughs> they love their job um the sight of people who love their job working uh, especially to do this emotional performance uh i think creates something on stage that that that's that's one of the things that people saw in warhorse that they're like wow you know i've never seen this before and you're thinking well actually that's that's true we normally hide that <laughs> but um but it's really cool isn't it you know <laughs> and it's not distracting because they're looking at the thing um so yeah i think that side of the devotional thing is more i can really i can really get into talking about that without understanding it yeah no i i uh, in in your book puppetry how to do it uh I, in virtual bookstores now. Uh, no, I, you, you talked about uh, in one of your first exercises, just getting on the floor as sort of a, a leveling field and, you know, you saying, it, you know, it, it might be a little uh, uncomfortable, but it'll kind of level the playing field for everybody. And uh, mm -hmm. it was just something that reminded me of, of that thing. So anyhow, thank you for talking about that. Um, yeah, I I, I want to get uh, deeper into directing puppetry because uh, at this point now you're you're somewhat esta you're established, and uh, yeah. I guess the question I might have for you is like how might you uh, give advice to someone to convince a theater that they should use a puppet director because I could imagine them just maybe bringing someone in for a workshop or something, but not necessarily be, uh, seeing the value in bringing you onto the full team. Yes, yeah, sure. I think. Um... I find it really useful to talk <clears throat> in all in all of these situations to try and talk to them in terms of something else that they understand better. <laughs> like, so you can do a show that's got some singing in it without musical director. You, you can, you know, if the songs, are, if it's not a musical show, if it's a play with a couple of folk songs or something in the background, and you would sometimes do that, right? Um, but if it's a musical, you're going to have someone who's going to look after their voices, train their voices. Uh, it's great to talk about that because you you can you can reel off the things that a, a good MD does to that cast to make them show ready and to keep them singing beautifully and to harmonise them. And everybody understands that that is a difficult job to do and um, and something that they always make time for. You just make time for it. You know, it's inconvenient if you're planning your rehearsals <laughs> to. But, you know, those two guys have got to go off and spend another two hours with musical director because something isn't working. But you never stop that happening. Um, and the same is true of the choreographer. And so in if you're in that situation, then that's the same with fight directors, um, uh, the same with a, yeah, an illusion specialist. You say, OK, well, if you want this done badly, you can, you can do it yourself. But if you want it done well, then you probably need someone in. And um, it it doesn't do you any harm to um, sometimes to have anecdotes about shows that haven't had puppetry directors. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and if you've seen some, especially if you think they might have seen them too, to say, you know, don't want to talk out of the turn, but did you see this show? And what you will see, there was a, a quite a high profile show here a few years before Warhorse and and um, there was no puppetry director and some of the puppetry was great. Got to say, it was some of them was brilliant and 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 they some of those people weren't puppeteers either. They them and they and the movement director had somehow found a language that worked. But the people who weren't self motivated, I guess, didn't have any one to help them, and so the ones that weren't really good were really bad. <laughs> and and it really, you can, you can see it from the stalls, even if you're not a puppetry specialist. The hard thing, I suppose, in a way is, um, because people don't see enough puppetry, they sometimes can't tell whether it's good or not. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I really believe that, but, but th that's what you keep coming across, especially with critics and, you know, people 
uh, people's feedback sometimes about shows that that you or I might think, oh, it wasn't so great. Uh, <laughs> someone said, oh, I saw that show. The pub tree is amazing, and you're like, oh man, that could have been really good. <laughs> <laughs> and this so this process of people learning, I think it's because people don't do puppetry. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I, I might, I probably say this in the book, I think there should be, um, that just like everyone should be doing puppetry badly, just like everyone does bad singing, bad dancing, that doesn't make them any less appreciative of fantastic dancers and singers. In fact, I think it probably makes them, you know, we all know we can't sing and we watch someone who's extraordinary and you say, wow. <laughs> um, that's really hard. Um, and uh, I wonder if people did more puppetry, they would um, they would appreciate the brilliant puppeteers more. Yeah. yeah, one thing that I feel like is a little bit of a challenge, though, with a puppetry director in that same sense is like with the examples of choreography and music in a musical, they're kind of a little bit more separate. You know, there's the big dance number, there's the big singing number, and even rehearsal wise, there's you know choreography day, singing day. But with the puppetry, you know, especially with interacting with the actors, you know, it's there's a lot more overlap there. And at what point does you know the puppetry directing start, and then the, the you know the director come in? And at what point are you done? Because I I kind of feel like at a certain point there is a point where you gotta. Tr- you know trust the puppeteers and then yeah. and then let the director do more of their thing as well because uh, a lot of time when i build puppets for a theater and i come in um mostly because of my own time and availability i don't i'm not there way, way too much what i kind of yeah. do is i i come in do a brief training show them how to not break the puppet <laughs> Yes. And then and then kind of, you know, let them explore it for a while, because another thing I always tell them, too, is like after a, a week of like five hour rehearsals uh, a day, you're going to kind of know how that puppet moves better than I might even move, you know, yeah. matter of trusting their own instincts. And and so what, what do you think about things like that? Yeah, no, you're right. And it can be a really delicate and tricky relationship um, because you definitely are going to tread on each other's toes like a number of times. And um uh, no one's going to afford to hire you to be in rehearsals every day, you know, and, unless it's War Horse. So, <laughs> um, so you, so you're coming in, yeah. You're training. You're giving them some sort of basic training. And again, I would try and say, I try and do that. Um, I try and do that for everyone in the cast. I try and negotiate that I can do a workshop with everybody in the company, not just the puppeteers, and that can go a long way to um, changing attitudes. Uh, in the group as a whole, and if the director joins in as well, that's real. That's the real bonus. Um, if you can get, so you just kind of say, "I'm just going to run it." It's going to be a happy puppetry workshop. It's not about these puppets. It's a kind of morning or an afternoon or day if you can get it. But then you're in, yeah. Once you're into scene work and there's the pressure of time, um, I think what I try and do is um, I try and explain to them that. I'm, tr- I'm trying to give them tools so that they can run the rehearsal room the way they normally run the rehearsal room. So you absolutely got to situate yourself as a servant of that director and that you're going to be helping them do their job, which means that you do kind of have to look to them. You've got 20 notes on your pad and, you know, you've got to look to them first and see what they say and then implement that, even if it conflicts with what you think. But um, you're a specialist coach, you know, and um, uh, what I do want is the, for the director to be able to give a note to the puppet character, just like they would to a human character. And I want them to not worry about how that should be done. So I don't want them to be saying, could you move your arm up a bit later? Or, you know, what would it be like if you took a step a bit earlier? Um, I want them to be thinking, Okay, I just want him to feel a bit more kind of angry, you know, <laughs> and uh, or whatever they, you know, kind of note they give. I hope they give. But um, <laughs> uh, and then you and the puppeteers go off and kind of solve that and kind of say, okay, well, how can we do that? Um, but um, it's uh, it's tricky. Some of my some of my best experiences have been when um, there's a director who's totally fearless about the puppetry. Uh, or ones where I've been, like you, like you're saying, Adam, uh, unavailable. <laughs> and you come back in after a week and you go, wow, I didn't know they could do that. Um, <laughs> well, that's so much better than what I would have asked you to do for that sequence. Um, 
and those collaborations are great. Actually, I really like that dynamic. So you, you, you get them started, you leave them alone, you encourage them to be themselves, do what they want to do, and then you come back. But I think there's a really important role that comes later because they don't understand the finesse. So you, you give them the tools, they make a mess, and then in that last stretch of rehearsals when we're trying to make it better, there's they need your eye to give the, the detailed notes that will make it really good. And so um, uh, I think that, that, that balance always in that stressful time around technical rehearsals and we haven't got much time and blah, 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 blah but um, you've got to ask for some a bit of technical time with the puppets. Yeah. And if I could just actually, because I, I, I was looking at this right right before we started recording, and you have a, a great part in your book, um, it, towards the end when you're just talking about puppets, you write, um, look again and again for clarity. The puppeteers might have a very detailed uh, psychological train running, but it might not be clear in the puppets' movements. Your great advantage being on the outside is to be the proxy audience. Anyone else on the outside can give a second opinion on whether something is coming across, but your eye as a puppeteer is different. With more knowledge of how things need to be clearer, you can suggest how a sequence of gestures might be broken up or phrased differently to allow the intent to come across more clearly to the audience. Mm. So that's kind of what we're talking about, but I think that's a great, you know, direct way of kind of you describing the difference of what a puppet director can do versus just a uh, a standard director yeah there's there's real merit and the the question is you know and the the bottom line question for the producer is how good do you want it to be yeah. <laughs> i mean that's that's what you're going to say the more <laughs> the more expert time you have the better your product will be of course it will you know and and um and actually that kind of equates for a for a money-minded producer um as yeah. well because they understand what that that, that equation is <laughs> It's it's yeah, I, I, and I think you're, you're what you're really teaching is sort of an empathy towards what the puppeteers are are going to be up against. We were on a shoot uh, about a year or two ago. Uh, you know, obviously we're kind of more the the television style puppet puppeteers, mm. and uh, we had a director tell us like, "Do we have to set up a monitor for this shot? Because like we really just don't, you know, we don't have time. We're about to lose our day, mm. and like, is it really going to take us?" You know, do you really need the monitor for this next yeah. setup? In in the case of them wanting uh, to not use the monitor, we said to them, "Well, that's fine. We we won't do this next take with the monitor if you promise us that everyone else will put a blindfold on." <laughs> <laughs> and they said, "All right, set up their monitor and do it quick." <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's I'm yet, trouble. yeah, in that world. <laughs> <laughs> But no, and I think I, I love the idea of teaching your uh, your non puppeteers in a show to give them a day or two just of of seeing what their yeah. what their castmates are yeah. up against. Well, it gives them let, lets them have like a little bit of empathy too of like what they're trying to do, and I think it helps the connection uh, a yeah. lot more. Yeah, and I mean, you know, if you're you know if you're in a luxurious situation, you can you can start to talk about you know what does it mean to act opposite a puppet and. Um, or, and this particular puppet, and you know, and almost all of the puppet, you know, not all of the puppet we see, but you know, from Henson's through to you know what we do on stage, it, the actor has to be aware of what the puppet is like <laughs> to 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 give the best performance for them, and and they quite often have to adjust uh, various things, not just not just pure technical things. So um, it, it's hard to explain that. But it's a lot easier to watch someone doing it and feel it, or try it yourself and feel it. And you know, it's. Um, it, it, I find it really useful to do these um, when you've got the time. You know, to do some of these things, not based on the script of the show that you're rehearsing, not with the character you're going to be playing. So some of that pressure goes out the window, and you're just playing with puppets and going, "Oh yeah, this is fun. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> this isn't arcade, and weird, and mysterious. It's." It's something I can relate to. Uh, I think that's really useful for characters. What uh, I, I have a, a question too about something, um, especially with working with the director. What if the director you you come back and see the show, or, or maybe it's a couple of days before it opens, and then you see that they made an unfortunate compromise <laughs> to what you have taught them how to do? Um, you know, res respectfully, yeah, obviously, like how how can you like um. Because uh, I remember going into training people and 
It's like, whatever you do, don't do this with the puppet. And then you go, they do it. And I can make up an example. Let's say War Horse, where it takes the two people or three people to manipulate the whole horse, right? And they're like, you know what? Well, this Larry's got to move this box at this time, and Joe's got to do move the curtain at this time. So, 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 Gary, just put the horse on and just run across the stage just for this one scene. And the legs are going like this, and you're trying to sound like you're breaking the whole illusion just for this technical aspect. You're losing so much and gaining so little. Like, what's um? That's a pretty extreme example. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> part of the podcast, right? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, look, it happens um, on some level. Um, and there's also things that, that I do, I suppose, you know, in a, uh, in a rehearsal where, you, where <laughs> I wish I hadn't done. But you, yes, you can't, you know, that's, that's a power discussion isn't it you just got to roll your eyes and and wish it hadn't happened in a in a way i think <laughs> and uh, and kind of go oh look it 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 does come down to um i think those early conversations that you have keep coming back to haunt you and um i remember a show where um the director i met the director for a first meeting ages before rehearsals there was a really nice one where they'd come to you early and and he explained what he wanted to do from the puppet and i kind of thought i don't know if the puppet can do that but it can i but i'm looking at what this material the puppet can do something really interesting so let's let's take the job and you know work with him and i'll and i'll spend time kind of getting him around to my point of view or we'll show him what it can do and we'll discuss it and we showed him what the puppet could do and he said oh yeah this is interesting and we went down a little journey and then when we got to the end of the process and uh, it, he didn't like it, eventually, <laughs> eventually he's kind of going, there's something not right about the puppet. I just suddenly remembered that first conversation and thought, he still, he just wants what he said he wanted, actually. And I haven't given it to him and I haven't a, been able to give it to him. And um, it's not his fault, actually. I, I, I kind of should have been clearer or he should have been listening when I explained that that wasn't possible. <laughs> um, and and so that's one way that the first conversation comes back to haunt you. And the other one is, is this, maybe it plays, comes back to that devotional state question, you know, that how you, um, how you talk about your work will determine how people think about your work. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes it is worth being a bit of a dickhead at the beginning of the process and making out that your stuff is very important artistically and isn't yeah. to be messed with. Yeah. <laughs> and, and kind of having those conversations and saying this is this is what's important this is what's not important don't worry about this do worry about this to try and just head that stuff off because the more they've heard it the more that uh, one of the voices in their head is like oh god i really don't want an earful from adam about you know using the puppet with only one puppeteer again <laughs> <laughs> he definitely say not to do that. he definitely said not to do that and that was important <laughs> whereas if you've never had that conversation the yeah. thing with the monitors cam is I think I've I think I've had that you know as well, and you kind of go, they don't know. That guy has no idea whether you can do it with a monitor or not. He he hasn't he hasn't got a clue, and he's not going to be bothered to think about it. So he's asking you, and actually, you know, he is asking you. <laughs> um, so you know, next time, how can I get into a situation where he does know? Um, right. You know, so that he either doesn't ask or you know has already had a conversation about an extra day's costs and we know it's expensive you know all of this stuff is um uh, all those compromises right. yeah no i mean i think most of my nightmare stories are, are to do with things that i said i could do that i turned out not to be able to do yeah. <laughs> you're like oh yeah i can make you this yeah. and then you know two days before the show you're like it doesn't work it's just, just too heavy it's breaking <laughs> You'll have to make an Oslan. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Is there ever a case where you do just build the puppets for the company and drop them off? Or you always you always work for them? No, I, right? I don't do that. Um, and yeah. um, uh, I think if I was a if I was a maker, if if I identified as a maker, I probably would mm -hmm. um, sometimes because some of those jobs can be really lucrative, and you know yeah. if you're running. A shop and you've got a few guys especially if you've got a team who you can usually not go around here but you um 
there's a there's an attraction to kind of just taking work and and keeping things turning over keeping people paid and keeping people happy but really i think that's that's in a way why um you know i, I don't say yes to all the people writing and saying can i have some elephants just like this elephant yeah. um <laughs> you know gosh god i could run an elephant factory uh well that would be interesting but it actually no that wouldn't be interesting at all that would be a, a lot of admin <laughs> <That's> <laughs> while, one, yeah. while people build elephants around me and no creativity so yeah i you know you, it comes down to the why are you doing this job and um i love being in that rehearsal room and working through the things with the actors and um one of the real gifts of that warhorse process was um especially like you know the third and fourth time or whatever, you know you you knew when you looked those guys in the face on the first in the auditions or on the first day of puppet training the ones who'd never done any puppetry before but just i don't know their agent had shoved them in the room or they kind of thought it might be interesting you, you knew that it was going to take them three months you know which is like an absurdly luxurious amount of time that's including previews and all of the kind of thing but in three months time, someone was going to come up to them and say, that's the most incredible puppetry that they've ever seen. And that this guy is standing here today. <laughs> going, I don't know what this is. <laughs> um, and that, that that journey will be difficult for them, <laughs> for them. Uh, but it will be incredibly beautiful for, feeling for them at the end. And you think, and I think, God, that's, that's just a lovely way to spend your time. <laughs> so I'd much rather do that than, um, than than take the jobs where um people aren't interested in my opinion so i'm lucky i guess uh, i've been lucky enough recently that i haven't had to take any of those jobs yeah and but, that's yeah. some advice i would recommend to, uh, to builders as well because that's one thing that i do you know when people ask me me to build a puppet some of my first questions are like who's going to be doing the puppetry for it and pretty much to see how seriously they take it because me building yeah. a puppet you know the puppet will only look as good as the performance as well no matter how big i look i make this pup how good i well i make this puppet they can still make it look lousy with their performance and that's my work too so sometimes you know sometimes people will offer me a decent amount of money and i'll say no anyway just because i i, I based on how the interaction is going or the meetings i can tell that they have a lack of uh interest or understanding for the performance of the puppetry as well yeah and you know I, I know how this must sound to people who um but i mean i find it difficult to say no and i quite often find myself you yeah. know trying to extricate myself from things that i thought would i would be able to do but they there isn't enough time um uh we all we all don't want to say no because we've all been freelancers and we've all been in those months where you're like i don't know what's happening now i don't know what's happening now. um and um and so, yeah, it can sound weird to say, oh, yes, you should say no to some of the jobs if they don't respect you enough. But actually, um, it's better for you to make something that you're in complete control of for free that, you know, and, and, and um, demonstrate your expertise that way uh, while working at the supermarket than it is um, probably to, to to do what you're describing there adam west you do something really beautifully and, and it gets trashed you know and and it's not a accurate reflection of, of of what you were able to offer um so yeah you know value yourself yeah yeah <laughs> or the worst one thing it's like can you make us a puppet your work is so great but it's only for one day so it doesn't have to be that good i was like oh, oh god no. just like you're really making me want to do this <laughs> could we make a version of it that's not so expensive and not so it doesn't have to be that good so you know because the audience won't really notice right. <laughs> it'll last, it'll last for the day. it's possible but i'm not Guess what? I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. not your guy for that. Yeah. yeah uh, there are <laughs> one one other question I had before we start talking a little bit about puppetry, how to do it in digital bookstores now, um, is uh, now that if, as you've mentioned, uh, things like The Lion King, uh, certainly Avenue Q, uh, War Horse, and uh, now Circus 1903. Now that those shows have um, existed and sort of permeated and and really created some icons and uh, for what puppetry and theater can be. Uh, are those conversations with directors or artistic directors or theaters getting easier for for you or for your cohort um, or contemporaries? Are you seeing that change as someone who's been in the scene for a while? 
definitely yeah definitely and it and it is about um it's about people having worked and moving around the, uh, i don't know what it's like over, over in the states but here um you know be nice to the producer's assistant because in five years time they're going to be or the person who's neg you're negotiating your contract with in some <laughs> other venue um you know the people move from job to job and they know because they once worked on war or they once worked on MEQ. uh they know how big the um maintenance department on a production of lion king is you know that's not a inconsiderable set of wages <laughs> um and they're working all the time and um so I think that's how that's that's how it comes out, and you're able to again, you're able to have conversation with people where you say, "I think you probably need to provide for physio on this show," and um, they say, "What are you talking about? Everyone's fine. We know we've got a provision. Um, well, when if they have trouble, they'll come talk to us." Um, and you're able to say, "Yeah, but you know, look at this show and that show and this show and that show, and and uh, and you know, talk to your friends and see what their physio budget is because." this is equivalent uh so you know just being able to have examples helps you um artistically people um you know there's the same tendency to say can i have a bit of that <laughs> that there always was you know i've seen this can i have one of those um could it be more or less exactly like you know I mean, the few rare occasions that i've tried to have conversations with commercial kind of advertising or marketing people um I, I found that world very difficult because they always said like could you copy this thing <laughs> that someone else has done really? yeah i'm waiting to see in another like, like 10 15 years how many rap musicals about founding fathers we have <laughs> <laughs> they're starting <laughs> yeah oh yeah um uh <laughs> so, um yeah exactly so um so there is a little you know there's this thing of oh can i have a big animal please um and you go you know there was a point when um i was doing teaching and there's a lovely puppetry school started in uh, in the uk called curious school of puppetry uh, that sarah wright um runs um which is really the best puppetry training professional puppetry training now here of which there is best very much and i was going into a bit of teaching there and 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 watching what they were doing and um and it was like, oh, this is, oh yeah, puppets can do so many things. They don't have to breathe and walk around and behave exactly like an animal. <laughs> no, you're doing this weird, weird way. You're teaching the puppet to do less, to do to do something that um uh, that looks like a looks like it isn't a puppet anymore. Um, so um, there's a danger of that. Too many copycat shows, um, and um, them kind of lose that kind of losing its meaning. But you know, we just need to find the um find the directors who and producers who are willing to to let us play you know i think there's a lot less fear of it and there's a lot more understanding um yeah some producers especially if they don't have those reference points easily available so sometimes i find this with producers from other countries do kind of double take when you say uh you need puppeteers <laughs> you, know, you need you need people to be trained um and you know you need maintenance people to look after the puppet people are like what are you talking about can't the props guy do it i'm like well would you like us to try and teach your props guy to do it because we could try but i can't tell you whether we whether they'll be able to do it or not um, the props guy has props to deal with yeah. <laughs> well there's that too right yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> you know this is a full-time job. Then why is it a full-time job? I've already, you know, I've already bought the puppet. You know, I've already commissioned the puppet, and you making the puppet. Make one that doesn't break. You're like, okay, well, <laughs> for the puppeteers to break, the puppets break. You know. <laughs> okay. so, oh god. Um, but yeah. yes, it is. It is easier. Oh god, that reminds me. I, I did uh, for a theater production. We did. Uh, they did Cinderella. It was a pretty big regional show, oh, I remember that. and uh, they had me build all these mice for Cinderella and this cat, and they wanted whimsy and 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 colorful. So I used this fur, and I delivered them, and I was really happy with how they looked. They looked great, and then I come back a week later, and they had painted them. They had painted them with glow in the dark paint. <laughs> 
You yeah. painted the fur? Like, what are you yeah. doing? Well, we needed them to glow in the dark. Why didn't you tell me that when I was making them? I could have figured something out. It's like, oh my gosh. Because that's one thing I noticed too. A lot of times people say, we we want this exactly, but they won't tell me about the project sometimes or what their uh, things are. It's like, so I always try to find as much as I can, especially after that, painting a fur puppet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh man! Well, uh, I do want to talk uh, for a little bit about uh, your new book, uh, Puppetry and How to Do It, uh, which is a uh, just a terrific resource. And congratulations on on putting it together, uh, because it it really walks people through um, how how to direct puppetry and a great way of just giving appreciation and shout outs to all the different departments that bring it together. Um, wonderful exercises for novices, beginners, people who are, are more experienced. And um, it's come personally at <laughs> the perfect time because I'm going to be working uh, with my, my high school, uh, my, my, the school I graduated from on a, a production of Little Shop of Fours. And I've got some other teaching gigs lined up. Um, so I want to thank you for this. I know Adam is always directing directing projects. Um, can you talk a little bit about about putting this book together? Yeah, I, I, you know, um, uh, I've been doing this these these jobs with actors a lot, and um, it was you're kind of refining these exercises, and occasionally I, I was you'd be lucky enough to. There's a point in your life where you where you can't go to workshops anymore, or you you can, you know, but it's 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 weird because they know you're experienced. <laughs> so, so you're trying to remember all the workshops you took when you were 23, you know, and 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 go, oh yeah, yeah, that worked. Um, when I was at university, um, there was a book called Impro, which I don't know if you guys would have it over there by Keith Johnston, okay. who was a um, a kind of a theatre maker who'd used a lot of improvisation in the in the 70s. And um, everyone had a copy of Impro and it was in the library and it was on the reading list for the theatre department. And, you know, and uh, it's a really good book. And, um, you know, I read the book and, and at the time I was like, yeah, OK, this is cool. I don't particularly I'm not particularly interested in improvisation, but OK, that's how it is. And it's it's got lots of exercises that you can do. And it wasn't until, um, you know, 15 years later that I, I realised that the generation older than me, were really suspicious about improvisation. Um, the traditional actors, they were, they they found it threatening, confusing, uh, foreign, like it was, um, it was really problematic and, and, and they're very resistant. So there's a generation of actors who are probably still knocking around now, but have much softened their attitude, where people are really resistant to people using it in the rehearsal room, kind of saying it was just kind of a waste of time. And um, I realized that no one of my generation thought like that, not, not because anything had changed, but because this book had been there and we'd all read it and gone, okay, yeah, that's not for me. Or yeah, I'm really into that. I'm going to go and do it. And I kept talking to school teachers and, um, you know, direct, and, and other directors who didn't have mu enough money for puppetry directors who would say, I, I'd really like to use puppetry, but I don't know where to start. And you think, well, it's not that hard. I mean, you know, it's like it's really hard to do it really well. Of course it is, like right. playing an instrument, but or dancing or singing, you know. <laughs> but there's a there's a, a feeling that puppetry requires um, you know, a, a, a kind of really complicated set of kind of knowledge or skills. It felt like it was in that same territory where you're going, people are confused and frightened by this <laughs> strange activity. Um, and they know it's not something they know about, and that's enough. That's enough to, to give them the fear. So the, the motivation really was to, to make a book that would be like Impro, that students could pick up when they're interested in theatre, that can say, okay, I could do this if I want to. And if, of course, if you want to do it, you'll get other books and you'll go to workshops and you'll teach from, learn from other people. Um, and, um, and so that was kind of the motivation behind it. And, also, one of the fun things about the Warhorse companies was that we would always try, um, would always try and connect with the local puppetry community when we came to make a new show. So, you know, if you're going to uh, uh, to New York or um, Toronto, you would, you would, or Berlin, you kind of, who does puppetry here? Because 
if I lived here and Warhorse came to my city and I wasn't given an opportunity to audition for it, I would be really cross. <laughs> so um, so the, the exercises that I was trying to do in the auditions or in the training needed to be okay for people who weren't idiots as well as people who were idiots. <laughs> so you right. kind of heard that. you're kind of anxious about this because you're kind of going, okay, well, I, I want to teach you first principles. And then the more you do it, the more you relax because everyone loves doing first principles exercises. And when you started to see um, experienced puppeteers given the opportunity to go back to just some object manipulation, improvisation thing, you know, where they're just play. I mean, it's just playing and enjoying, remembering how they do it um, with no pressure. Um, they're getting something else out of that exercise from the person who's doing it for the very first time. But the two of them can play a scene opposite each other. And yeah, sure, one of them is technically precise and incredible and beautiful. Uh, but the other one is getting something else out of it. And the scene still works, you know, the little you can learn things if you're in the audience you can learn things from each of them so um and i really liked that way of teaching where i'm not listing um you know movement is you know uh, focus is important and fixed points important and you know and all of these things that um that you might write down if you're making a list of principles i, I found that a turn off when i was learning things and so um what I found was that if you got some people to improvise for each other and and turn that um, kept them short so that everyone's getting a go and kept them short so that no one felt like they had to make it the best performance they've ever done um, you could ask the audience what was good <laughs> and the audience who were the people who are learning would tell you all of the things that you wanted to talk about so they go oh yeah the noises she's making are really cool I really <laughs> relate to the to the to the character because of that and you've got to work hard sometimes to get them to say things because they they seem so obvious or they seem daft or kind of stupid but um yeah i mean it's brilliant suddenly all you suddenly all you're doing is helping people confirm that they already know how to do this <laughs> they right. instinctively understand what, what's successful and you can help them with what isn't successful but what I want them to come out of it with is, oh yeah, I kind of knew that. And, 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 and I feel that when I've been learning from other people, that's been my favorite feeling at the end of a course. Like, yeah, I went on this marionette course and you know what? I was right about marionettes. Now I've, what, what's happened during that time is I've forgotten all the things <laughs> that I was wrong about marionettes <laughs> and had confirmed some of the things that, that were right. And, you know that's what you want isn't it you kind of that way the, the learner uh feels like they've got some control rather than that they've got some homework to do and oh my god i could go and try and remember what the relationship between weight and breath breath is <laughs> yeah well it was a it was a nice uh read to kind of get you away from the academic in a sense um and especially you know I, i've taught courses at uh at my uh my college and uh just the dread of thinking like oh i got to build a bunch of rehearsal puppets for this thing and you know trying to put tabletop pieces together and all sorts of stuff and then you know your first chapter is just find some sticks <laughs> and it's it, it went immediately to like of course that's what you do um that's so much simpler and at the end of the day it does the same thing as you know something you put together with masking tape and newspaper yeah, I still want to make some uh, workshop puppets, but I never get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, you feel people deserve more. But um, And there's a point, especially if it's not for beginners, um, that you think, yeah, actually, at this point, you would you would benefit from, um, from something that you have more control over. Um, but, you know, uh, I will one day. But, uh, you know, and I, I'm, I'm incredibly nervous about the book because you, you, you think, um, I think, um, I don't know if this works if someone else does it <laughs> um, um, and and i only know from you know all, all of the exercises of course are in some way stolen and cobbled together from other things that i've done with other people in as it all um, instruction is and so you you're like well i definitely changed that a lot uh because i forgot it and uh you know i did what <laughs> seemed to work with those people in the room at the time um 
and I'm going to try and write it down, but I've no idea <laughs> whether it works for anyone else. So I, I'm, I, I just hope it, uh, it's okay, and um, maybe I'll get some Amazon reviews to tell me. <laughs> Great. Well, people should definitely, definitely do that. And uh, just one other thing that I want to pull from the book that I really liked that reminded me of something that you've dealt with a couple times, which speaks to uh, actually people painting uh your your cinderella puppet oh okay. was uh in in the section on respect for the puppet uh you write uh you should make the assumption that the puppet is the way is that way for a reason it's definitely true that the particularities of the puppet will affect the way it uh, performs it might be that a certain part of the puppet is stiffer than the maker intended or a joint looser but we should all try at first to take the puppet as it is and learn to play with its personality quirks and uh and even accidents in the making process can give the puppet a specific and uh characterful movement and um i just think about how many times have you had people you know write to you about your avenue q puppets like ah uh, you know the neck doesn't quite do the thing it you know we want it to do and it's like well Maybe it doesn't have to do that. And it remind you know, I, I think of people who talk about respect for a, a script of a screenplay or or the text of a, a, a live performance. And you know, sometimes that's just another element of your show that you have to you have to respect that you have to kind of work not I don't want to say work around, but understand why it is that way. And I I just loved having that written out expressly uh, in I mean this lovely book. <laughs> It's more in hope than in expectation, you know. <laughs> sure, yeah, absolutely. And there's a whole bunch of people whose whose first response to something being difficult is to stay and you change it, and uh, and you know you try and you try and stop yourself when it's you, you know. But I'm sure I do it too uh, some of the time. Oh, <laughs> go, of course. Go, okay, but this is what we've got, <laughs> so let's see what it does, you know. But then you're you're, you're asking the um, you're asking the team to be um, flexible and playful and creative. And actually, sometimes they're not very creative. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Oh, that's really funny. Well, um, you know, we so appreciate your time. And I, I'm sure we could all talk for hours, but it it is probably getting late over there across the pond. Um, so as we start to wrap up, uh, something that we always ask people is uh, if you have a, a good experience, uh, an experience that happened to you in a rehearsal hall or as you were maybe watching a show that uh, gave you some puppet tears uh, that now looking back on it, you could kind of uh, say, you know, oh, that was actually pretty funny or or anything. And uh, Jean Marie Kevins told us when we talked to her that you would have some good producer stories. So. <laughs> I, I bet I have. I <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some. There are all sorts of interesting producer stories where the, the producers are hard um, and don't understand or can't afford it. Whatever. No, I, I suppose the one. The, there's a. They're all about making. The, the tears ones are all about making. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember uh, when I was starting out and I was doing these. Um, shows at Battersea Arts Centre and uh, we were doing, I think it was a Christmas carol and, and we'd said, oh, we'll make this huge Jake, giant Jacob Marley with lots of things. We'll do it all with um, kind of wet glue, you know, papier-mâché kind of thing with fabric. And um, the only place that we had to work in was a railway arch, which um, in London we have these kind of workshops under railway arches and they're huge and cold and uh, drafty and we were in kind of October, November, it was cold. And uh, I think there were two or three of us standing around this table with our hands going into cold, wet PVA, dipping things on and oh. they, they just all down the table, just loads to do and more layers. And there was one fan heater and um, uh, we <laughs> hand over on the fan heater for a bit and then come back and experience the pain again. And it was miserable, and we were behind schedule, and it was awful. And um, and then uh, it would, must have been kind of after three when the schools finish, and uh, we heard some kind of footsteps down the pathway at the end of the workshop, and um, the little schoolboy head peeked around the corner. And South London schoolboys are, are, um, are not very well behaved, and uh, we, thought, we just thought, oh no, and now we're going to get you know kids coming in and laughing at us and 
boy kind of stared for a bit and um we tried we tried to engage him and he ignored us and his head popped out and he went they're doing art <laughs> <laughs> and they ran off and just for a moment we looked at each other and went doing art <laughs> like it felt less like art in, in any way it was the most miserable day um, <laughs> So that, that was genuine tears, I think, that day. Um, and yeah, the other one I kind of alluded to, uh, um, this was a, a relatively high profile show for me, again, relatively early in, in my career. I was really excited to be doing the show. And we have this tradition of these Christmas shows where they, the directors always try and throw everything at them and they want loads of special effects and showbiz and spectacular things. They're not quite as um, tawdry as the, uh, pantomimes that we have but it, they're, they're a kind of classier version of that and um, it was a magic carpet themed um, kind of Arabian Nights kind of show and I had ambitiously <laughs> promised that I'd made various things for this thing many of which worked but I'd, I'd, um, I'd promised these flying carpets with miniature versions of the actors that I was going to make out of carbon fiber rods uh, using kite parts and I'd been to the kite shop and got loads of stuff and I was excited about it and um, and uh, uh, and the movement was going to be amazing and um, <laughs> and it had taken a long time to get these parts and various other things gone late and it was really you know we were coming up to the tech session and he hadn't seen them and they'd not never been in the rehearsal room and um, they didn't well, I just it just it was never gonna just got to the point where you where you're looking at it and going, this is never going to work. There is no amount of elastic or counterweighting or kind of handles in different places that is gonna make this work. This is just always gonna collapse. <laughs> and um having to go into that rehearsal and ask for a moment of the director's time when he was really stressed and say, I have completely failed to give you <laughs> to deliver this thing and i can't deliver it for you and that scene which you don't have time to re-rehearse has got no puppets in it oh it was awful and so we spent i think we uh we pulled kind of a couple of all-nighters making flat <laughs> flat versions or something like that <laughs> it, was, it was awful but yeah 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 um promising too much and not being able to deliver is um that haunts me you know um, but yeah, it's not always fun, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Making big elephants. Really is really That's cool. showbiz. Yeah, <laughs> right? it's how you learn, right? But uh, great. Now, do you, uh, so what's the best way for people to follow your work and uh, connect with you? I'm um, old enough to be terrible at social media. And, um, so uh, I do have a Facebook page, which is updated about once a month. Uh, and um, um, But I, a significant object can be found on Facebook. Um, I, I, I update the website whenever we do a new show. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm on the Internet. You know, you can find me if you want me. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. And how could people get this lovely uh, book of yours? This book is available uh, from the publishers, if you like, Nick Hearn Books. I don't know if I get more money if you buy it from there, but I doubt it. Um, and from all good, reputable bookshops. And if they don't do it, you should ask for it, because that's probably good. <laughs> Perfect. Wonderful. Well, Mervyn Miller, thank you so much for coming on Puppeteers. Thank you for this book and uh, all the work that you've done and are going to be doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. been a real pleasure. Okay. Certainly, and we didn't even talk about the O'Neill, but I mean, you always talk about the O'Neill, so that's, that's fine. You know what? We have we, we're we're interviewing Pam tomorrow, uh, so uh, yes, and it'll kind of help with uh, with applications. Hopefully, that she's coming on to to talk about that. So it'll yeah. be we we've been looking forward to that one. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I have to say, it going on the O'Neill was a real eye opener for me in terms of the culture and um, uh, and diversity of puppetry and in the states and and um there's nothing like it you know and alice tries to does something similar in in uh, in germany and i i went there last year but it's um you know the the intensity <laughs> the sort of intensity and and uh fraternity of that environment is wow so powerful um uh, 
felt so um, lucky to have been there and had no idea how good it was going to be. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> and then you go there, you go, wow, everyone really cares about this. This is really, you know, big deal for everybody. And it's um, understanding how far everybody comes from. Yeah. To come together in that place for that period of time and how long they go without seeing another puppeteer. <laughs> <laughs> totally well and and I, I could say as someone who had i think the time that you were there was maybe my sixth or seventh o'neill and um you know sometimes when we get you know big names coming for the first time everyone's a little apprehensive of what the ego is going to be and all that kind of stuff and it was just so wonderful to see you walking from place to place and checking in in the shops and you know going to the pub every night so it was, it was such a great oh. way to to learn and meet you and and have you join in the fraternity so it was, uh, we, 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 yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll we'll be able to see you there some other time soon. So, yeah, hope so. Oh, maybe I'll come and do the trooper course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be you could be a croupy. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, thank you again so much, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks, bud. Yeah, good. Stay in touch, and really, really nice to chat. Absolutely. Thanks, you too, buddy. Bye.